Good morning, everyone. I wish to acknowledge the chairman, members of the board, and staff of the Center for Gender Studies. Distinguished speakers, Professor Omo Ojo and Mrs. Esosa Onibamo Esquire. Distinguished professors present, ladies and gentlemen. I am Professor Uwa Edosoma, Director of the Center for Gender Studies. I wish to welcome you to one in the series of our bi-monthly seminars organized by Center for Gender Studies. For some time now, we were not able to hold these uh, seminars because of the coronavirus pandemic. So it's a joy to be back. And I wish to welcome you all for coming and I know you will be well impacted by these speakers. The first topic is African Women in Development, which will be taken by Professor Omo Ojoy, of, formerly of Clark and Atlanta University, Atlanta, Georgia. And by res the second topic is responding to cases of gender-based violence and its impact on economic productivity. This will be taken by Mrs. Esosa Onibamo from the Ministry of Social Development and Gender Issues. She will be talking from the point of first responder because she works there and she sees the gender-based violence incidents every day. So we will all be well impacted and at the end we hope you will be able to pass the message to other people so that gender-based violence will be reduced in our society. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that this is the day the Lord has made. Sorry, I'm coming from Scripture. So we will rejoice and be glad in this. So I want you to rejoice. I want you to be glad. I want you to be happy. I want you to be expectant. Okay? First of all, I would like to um, introduce myself. I'm Ms. Zubin. I'm a staff of the center. And I'm your anchor person for today's seminar. Please, can you clap for me? So I'm comfortable. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. On behalf of our director, I would like to welcome everyone present here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for honoring our invitation. And I also like to especially welcome our board, the board of this center, every led by our distinguished chairman, Professor Mrs. Oluro. You are welcome, you are welcome, sir. And we want to especially welcome our by our speakers. Only one of our speakers is here for now, Professor Ujio. I want to say you are welcome, sir. Thank you for coming. Thank you for honoring our invitation. Okay, our second speaker is here, so please can you clap for her too? Thank you for coming, ma'am. Okay, so we'll go right into the business of the day. But we, her name is Mrs. Oni Bamo. I hope I got that right. Barista Mrs. Oni Bamo. You're welcome, ma'am. Okay, so we'll go straight into our business for the day. But first of all, we'll just ask please, if you have your phones with you, could you just put them on silent so we reduce the distractions? Let's put our phones on silent. Then if we have to use the door, I think there's a door at the back to minimize the distractions, so we could use the door at the back if we need to come in or out. Then the convenience too is at the back. When you come out, take your left. Convenience is right at the back in case you need to use it. So, once again, thank you and you're welcome. We'll stand up for a brief opening prayer. That will be led by Lisa, the woman, the senior assistant registrar in this center. Please just put our hands together for him. Good morning, Lord. Father, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Father, we want to thank you for this time. We have come to share knowledge and to share inspiration for the Holy Spirit. We pray that the topic of the 
For some time now, we have not really had any activity because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But we are delighted to be back. And this morning, we have decided to uh, we decided to invite the speakers to come and talk to us this morning on this uh, topical issue. One, the first one is African women in development. Just as the uh, man who prayed said, we know that the African woman or the women in Nigeria and women in every nation do help to build the nation. Even though, even when many, many times they are not uh, giving their due recognition, but they are the bedrock on which nations, families uh, grow. Secondly, we'll be listening to another talk that borders on economic development of the nation. We're going to be listening to um, a talk titled Gender-Based Violence is Implication on Economic Productivity. We know that the issue of gender and violence is up, especially during the pandemic. The, uh, the, it was a it rose to an epidemic proportion. In fact, because many of the people, uh, the, the perpetrators were in the home and those who were being um, violated were locked in during the lockdown with their, with their, the perpetrators were locked in with their victims, it became very obvious that we had so much of rape, of depression, of all manner of violence that were experienced by majorly women and also some few men. So she'll be talking about it because she's from the Ministry of Social Development and Gender Issues. Every day they handle the affairs of uh, the family. People come to complain to them on the issues of violence in the family. So she'll be talking to us this morning, enlightening us on what might impacts on economic productivity. So I welcome you up once again and I believe we will all be well impacted and will go better than we think this morning. You are welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we'll also be taking a brief address from Chairman of the Board of the Centre, Professor Mr. Tolubo of the Faculty of oh, sorry, Institute of 
Indonesia. So, our guest speakers, our guest permit me to stand from the existing protocol. I'm quite delighted to be here today. I bring you greetings from the Institute of Education of our campus, the University of New where I work. Permit me to congratulate the Center for Gender Studies for putting together an event like this. A university all over the world is set up not only to teach and issue certificates to students, but also to carry out research and community service on topical issues for the society. In summary, therefore, a university is set up to teach, carry out research, and render community service to improve the life of the beneficiaries, the community around, and the nation in general. Every unit of the university ought to be involved in these activities. The Center for Gender Studies is involved in all this. What we are doing today is an aspect of community service. Who knows, a life will be saved or improved by the knowledge we will get. The center has a journal on gender studies. We are encouraged to send in articles to the journal. All registered participants should ensure they have their email address written on the registration sheet. At the end of this session, the flyers of the, the flyer of the journal will be sent to our email addresses. Before I end this address, let me encourage us to use the facilities in our environment. For instance, we expect organizations to commission the Center for Gender Studies to give talks, organize seminars, workshop, conference for the organization on gender-related issues. And thereafter, a group of readings will be a product of such um, activity and society will be better off for it. You know, the university is set up to help society. But the problem is that society is not, invi is not inviting the university to help. So when you commission any aspect of the university, they will not come out and really showcase what they have. So, dear madam from the ministry, you heard us. Yes, we are here. People are paying us. So, if you invite us, we will be quite delighted. And we are ready to uh, render assistance. Once more, I want to congratulate you, of course. Um, I'm sure we are going to be enriched in our knowledge concerning gender issues. Thank you once more for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're going to our first lecture for the day by Professor Joe. Before that, I want to read a brief citation of our guest lecture. Professor Omar Theodore is a product of Canada University, Los Angeles, California, USC. He holds a master's degree in public administration and bachelor of arts in political science and journalism. He obtained his PhD degree at the Frank and Panta University in Atlanta, Georgia, USA. He is a writer and author. Professor Ojo has published numerous articles in local and international media and in many journals. The propounder of the concept Holy Harmony 1983, Professor Ojo is married with a beautiful family. To his four grandchildren and one great grandson. He currently resides in Atlanta, Georgia, United States of America. Today, we will be speaking to us on the theme of the seminar, which is African Women in Development.
director of this uh, center, the doctor, the doctor, all of us present are working together. Before I would do anything, I would like to thank the doctor, the doctor, Technology. 
and was followed by cultural innovation that brought about the language through the composition of symbols, sounds and symbols that enable communication of thoughts, feelings, and exchange of information about life. From the foregoing brief annals of the beginning of this term, the early man and woman on it were the father and mother of humanity. In that capacity and time, while men hunted for food in the forest, women tended fire and children at home. Anthropologically, anthropological history has revealed that the first Homo erectus, that is, the first human to have walked on this on on, on feet, standing up on this earth, is an African male and female. This being the fact and truth, it would appear sacrilegious and laughable for one to suggest that women in Africa were devoid of the place and position in the scheme of things in Nigeria and Africa generally. In spite of the vindicated primordial gift of the early Africans, some contemporary ill-motivated races and some in improperly informed in their quest to know have continued to speak the untruth about the correct political status of women in Africa. Otherwise, we need to discuss women in development, which is rather too wide and large to focus upon at this time in our life in Africa would not arise. African women in development, therefore, may be discussed from an African perspective because African women in pre peronic Egypt, pre colonial period in Africa, and post independence in Nigeria, particularly, have continued to maintain their preeminence within the culture of the land. Development of our women, or women in development, must not be viewed for, from the Western point of view. In other words, one must not judge the African woman based on the air she may not have burned to look like that of the, the Londonian like a German lady or anglo saxon woman to be regarded as developed or accommodated within the African political arena. Rather, as one has conscientiously argued in the book, in the book, African woman and political development, a case study of this are for women in the United States Nigeria. Women in Africa have been in their nature a down cultural place and have been playing as appropriate in the game of politics on hinder. Within the realm and focus of our attention, development therefore has to be redefined as being mentally strong, energetically dynamic, alert, and competent. These are the elements with which African woman is made of. Otherwise, Nigeria's socioeconomic and political setting would have collapsed before now due to inappropriate leadership or its lack thereof. The African family unit, the base or foundation of society, is still in place. But struggling to be allowed 
in its way in Africa as the progenitor of the human race. The struggle of the first human family here in Nigeria, arguably, has been the result of some foreign external influence allowed. How else do we explain an ugly situation in which very young children speak in foreign languages with their parents at home, while the mother and father speak with their they in every language. How else can one explain that the most enviable African family system, polyamony, is still begging to raise up its beautiful head proudly over 60 years after independence? These aberrations are due, are not due to women not being given equal opportunity or position with men, not are the aberration the fruit, nor sorry, excuse me, nor are the aberration the cause of the women in Africa, which are the result of lack of political consciousness brought about by misguided rulership devoid of competent political leadership and will. Conclusion. Our opinions and findings have been properly expressed in our program, which is the focus of our attention. It is considered a duplication that consumes time if other conclusions are to be drawn or made in this our brief remarks regarding our subject matter. We are immensely grateful to our dynamic professor, Mrs. Uwa Edozo, and director of the Gender Studies Department at UNIVEN. You should be known in its earlier days as universe for all the efforts put together to have provided the opportunity for this exchange of ideas. And we thank all of you distinguished professors and scholars who have focused, I mean who have found the time to be with us for this event and more, more also than to all of you who are trying your, your time to be here with us. Thank you. There will be no question and answer now until after our second speaker has given us a lecture, then we'll take it together. So we'll read the citation for this. Mrs. Esosa Wimibamwa is a being based lawyer and social work officer. She is the officer in charge of psychosocial counseling in the Ministry of Social Development and Gender Issues, being sitting in this seat. She is happily married with children. Today she will be speaking to us on the topic responding to cases of gender-based violence and its impact on economic development. Mrs. Ola Wimibamwa. Chairman of board, director of the Central Gender Studies, Professor, I'm very honored to be in your presence, standing on this critical 
And I bring greetings from the Ministry of Social Development and Gender Issues and Empowerment and Staff. My name is Mr. Sosa Oliva. Glad to be in your meet today. The topic before us today is not uh, a theory. It's something that is happening real. The practical thing to me and to us in the ministry is an evil that must be stopped by everyone. The topic is responding to cases of gender-based violence and its impact on economic development. The evil of gender-based violence is no longer what is seen or heard from afar in social media, television, or in newspapers. Before now, we used to hear it. It was when I got to the ministry many years ago that I discovered that it's not something that is just in newspapers. It's happening real. It's an evil that now exists very close to us in our communities, in our neighborhood. And when we hear of GBP, gender-based violence, some concepts will arose our attention and our consciousness, like what is gender, what is violence, and what is GBP itself. So in that regard, I would like to attempt to define this concept. When we say gender, when we say what is gender, from the definition that I have here, I said gender it refers to characteristics that over time are culturally, politically, economically, and socially assigned and associated with, with the two sexes, male and female. It is what the society believes to be appropriate rules, duties, rights, responsibilities, accepted behavior, opportunities, and status for women and men in relation to one another. When we say gender, we are saying that now it is what society deems as uh, responsibility or roles. You know, before now, we know when we say gender, I am a woman, you are a man. She is a female and he is a male. But things are different now. We get, we get to hear of transgender. When a man will wake up one morning and say, I don't want to be a woman anymore, I want to become a man. So we sometimes we walk around with people who don't know that biologically or naturally they are they behave and they are not become free. So that's what we refer to as gender. Sometimes society determines, you know, a male or a female. We are hoping that our Nigerian society will begin to adopt things that are actually positive and not things that are have negative impacts, even to our own born children. So when we say violence, the World Health Organization in 22 broad definition of violence is the intentional use of physical force or power, charity or action against oneself, another person, or against a group or community that either result in or has a high likelihood of resulting in injury, death, psychological harm, maldevelopment or deprivation. I really wish that we could have we were going to have a uh, 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 yes, the slide, the projector. Okay. But we'll just try and get the information that we want us to take some key things home today. Even though we don't have a project to show what's a bridge project for, for us here. But let's try to pay attention, listen, and get some things home today. Then we say types of violence. Violence comes to different forms. Comes as physical violence, as beating, punching, or even killing someone. It comes as verbal violence. We are going to be focusing on verbal violence. Then we also have sexual violence. Then we sexual violence, sexual harassment, rape, sexual exploitation, forced abortion, forced pregnancy. Then we also have other kind of violence, psychological violence. It has to do with um, isolation, putting persons in confinement, that could affect their mental capability. So, the, the kind of violence we will be looking through it. 
then we have socioeconomic boundaries. What is this socioeconomic boundaries? What are we happening with parents? For example, you have a situation where married women are not allowed to work, or we have uh, women, girls who are already employed, but they are underpaid. It's a kind of violence. You know, and because uh, uh, the income is actually necessary, the necessity, so whatever that is paid to you, you accept it. But it is below your standard or below what you are putting in. These are all kinds of foulness. Then, let's define GPP. We hear oftentimes GPP, sometimes you see protests going from different NGOs talking about GPP, why it should be stopped, saying no to gender based foulness. What is actually gender based foulness? I said here that gender based violence, any acts or threats of harm inflicted on a person because of their gender. Gender based violence is an umbrella term for any harm that is perpetrated against a person's will that has a negative impact on the physical or psychological health, development, and identity of that person. Although not exclusively to women and girls, but principally. Gender-based violence affects them across all cultures. What we are saying here is this. We know gender-based violence comes across both male and female. But you and I will agree that when we are talking about issues of gender-based violence, the victims, the survivors are mostly women and the girl child. We are the front liners. The stories that come to us on a daily basis mostly are women and girls or the girl child. Out of a hundred cases, we can have maybe just one victim who is a male. Majority of our victims and survivors are women and girls. So why is it like that? Because some seem to see them to be the weaker set. They cannot struggle, they cannot talk, they cannot they cannot speak, they see they see them to be helpless. And like I said at the beginning, that before I got to the ministry, I never knew there were things like violating a child, defining a child, defining a newborn baby, two months old baby. I never, I never knew such things. I was thinking it was just in the movies, it was not real. You know, we want to hear in social media, what we see in social media, some of them they are just stories, they are like that, some movies, they are not real. But we are seeing and we now know reality. Our women are actually suffering. The only prayer, the man that led the prayer said, everyone is born by the woman. Women bring nothing to the woman. When you want peace, when you want progress, the woman must be involved. When a woman is happy, a woman will have peace. When a woman is not happy, you will see issues in that home. But our women out there, they are facing lots of problems. And the reason why I'm glad that I'm here today, and I appreciate the person for giving me this opportunity, I'm really humble being here. So enlighten us, let us know that these things are not just out there in social media. It's a terrible situation. It is an evil that we should try to reduce, if possible, and eliminate it. Gender-based violence, harm, injury, inflicted on a particular uh, gender. Because they are weak. Women are not weak. There are reasons why they are not speaking. And those reasons of us so let you go stay. So I said here that the categories of perpetrators of this gender-based violence include family members. You know when we see it on social, when we see it in, in the news, we we'll think that ah, this of a thing, nobody that is close to that woman can ever do a thing like this. Or nobody close to a child can ever have a child like this. But the opposite is the case. We have realized that the perpetrators of this evil are family members who are close to these victims, who are you least expect to cause injury on a child or a woman. They are the ones perpetrating this evil. So I said here that categories of perpetrators include family members, they also include community members, people that live around the neighborhood, friends and people that you can trust your children with. 
then I also say here that uh, and those that act or on behalf or in proportion to disregard culture, religion, state or interstate institutions. What do we mean by people that act on behalf of institutions? What do we mean by this? We have seen situations where we have traditional rulers defining children. We have seen the cases of police officers defining children. The only main case, we have about two cases that involve the male in the recent times. In the past six months from July to this time, we have seen, we have experienced lots of cases. But the only two that we have in our custody is a child, a, a 12, 13 year old boy, that was being defined by police officers. So I said here that the people that know the law, that know the laws, that know the moral values, custodians of our institutions, of our norms, they are the ones disregarding these norms, violating it and defiling our women, our girl child, our children. Our world has brought them to this situation. I'm going to give you an example that I said, maybe it's just paperwork. I wanted to actually put this paperwork on the screen for you to just read the right. But I'm going to be telling you practical. This is not a uh, movie, it's happening really. So we found out from this little child, what happened? Why did you get close to this police officer? We find it found him on social media while he was browsing with his mother's phone. That's how he got to meet this police officer on his own platform. And they started talking. The guy invited him, come and buy me something, come and do this. And this man started about defining his child. And there are some things we'd like to clarify today. When we are talking about gender based violence in terms of children, any child that is below 18, we call it child defining. Then when that individual is above 18, we call it rape. Of course, there are different forms of violence. We have domestic violence where the, 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 the husbands beat their wives and all that. But when it comes to gender based violence, any act that has to be sexual issues with the children, they are called child defining. So this police officer who knows the law, who was supposed to be safe or protect this child, this child ought to be safe with the police officer, and he was the one defining this boy until it was discovered. So, what I'm saying here is this, that cultures, that these custodians of, the, of culture, of moral principles, they know the laws in their locality. They still go ahead to disregard this law by committing gender-based violence against women, most of which are against their child. These children that's supposed to be safe with these people, they know they are being victims in their hands. I said, why both females and males experience violence? Evidence suggests that risk factors, patterns and consequences of violence against females are different than against the male. The females suffer it the most. There are grave and potentially life-threatening health outcomes as a result of gender-based violence. The exact consequences vary depending on the type of violence. Gender-based violence can result in many negative consequences for health and well-being of females. It can also affect their children and undermine their economic well-being and undermine the economic well-being of the society. What are we saying here? Violence on the women reduces their productivity. And at the end of the day, transforms the larger society. Like, like statistics will tell us, we have more females, more women. Imagine if every woman were to be empowered, we will have a better economy, we will have high productivity. Across all spheres, women in different professions, they are selling, but they are few compared to the main four. And rather than encouraging our women, our women still suffer families. This issue, needs to be addressed at all times, it should be reduced, possibly it should be eliminated. I said due to their fear, most societies tend to blame the survivor for the incident, especially in cases of rape. This social rejection results in further emotional damage, including shame and self-hate and depression. Due to their fear of social stigma and rejection, most survivors never report 
the incidents. I never received proper health care and emotional support. When we hear of cases of rape, defilement, we tend to blame the victims. Rather than encourage them, give them our moral support, we tend to blame them. Even the custodians of the law, when we take cases to the station sometimes, right there on the shanty, what were you doing there? Who can you were even dressed? Why are you wearing this? I feel sorry for your parents. You are castigating the victim rather than rendering support. So because of all this, most of most of the victims, they don't say anything. And they cannot get the help that is needed. And the consequence of gender-based violence. Gender-based violence is here in the system. It's violence, injury in case, mostly the feeling. We know that men suffer from it. We cannot consider, you cannot imagine the situation of men to women suffering from gender-based violence. And record, it's only the records that don't get facts. And the record that we see on a daily basis is mostly women. We hardly see the male child coming that he was defined or he was defined. Only a few cases. In general, it's just two just two cases. But on a daily basis, we have something less than 10 children coming for the family. And the, and, and the, and the uh, pandemic made it worse. During the pandemic, why some uh, offices were locked? We were at work 247 because of cases of gender-based violence. Children were being defied. The, the, the rate increased and really alarming. The women were beaten up. It was the one that was poured hot water when she, she rushed to the ministry looking for them. So the lockdown actually made it worse. We know we used to receive things from child infirmary and all that. But during the lockdown, it was terrible. So we are hoping that uh, we should continue to campaign, we should continue to put it out there, that this thing is existing should be stopped. Gender-based violence. My focus is mostly on the women and the girl child. Our, feet, our little girls are being defined on a daily basis. If we don't speak out, the, the rate will continue. It should be stopped. It should be stopped. But we need to speak out that this thing is existing. It's not just in the media, in the newspapers, it's in the existing right where we live. And there are consequences. You know, one consequence that I put, I said social consequences of gender-based violence. I said most incidents of gender-based violence are never reported to anyone due to victim blame. As I said earlier, when a girl child is raised, the next thing they start analyzing what she's wearing, where she was. And I keep and I keep and I encourage that no matter what you wear, nobody has the right to defy you. Nobody has the right to touch you. No matter what you wear and where you have. Because if you are seen as what they wear or what they are where they had that particular time, what if I need to baby? The child is less than two months or less than two years. What was that child wearing? I said loss of ability to function in the community. Because it is a consequence of gender-based violence. Most women that come to us, they have lost confidence completely as a result of verbal violence. The husband keeps telling her, you are good for nothing, you cannot amount to anything, you are useless, you are this, you are that. And we keep telling them, the, the healing process for verbal violence is actually almost eternity. Because when you bruise yourself, that physical injury can get healed. But the emotional injury will be there. So we try to encourage our women. Who oh, are not useless can become somebody? Look at this, look at this, look at Professor Dosoma. Look at the likes of Ugozi Iweda. You can become what you want to be, you can shine. But this verbal violence is from the war. That's why we are saying that the perpetrators of gender based violence are family members where the men torment their wives until they become like good for nothing. How can they contribute meaningfully to economic development? How can they be productive? A woman that has received so much of that nature of violence, how will she be asked when she gets to work? You have removed that zeal, that passion to become something better, that passion to get to the peak of, of her career. You have removed it by verbal violence. 
see that she cannot be nothing. She cannot amount to anything. And these women will take time to talk to them. So we are also saying that another consequence of gender-based violence is social stigma. Some of the women feel they can no longer associate with their fellow women out there. They feel withdrawn, they can't make meaningful contributions. When a, a, a good topic is being shared, being discussed, this women cannot make meaningful contribution because someone has told them, or maybe the pity they are perceived, they are ashamed to even step out. We said social rejection and isolation. So women have become isolated because of gender-based violence. Situation whereby their husband locked them in after beating them up, they are being locked in, or they want to strike in their career, but the man says no, you must remain in the house. If they are confined to the house, they can't even watch the television. You can think that these things they are not uh, real. We see them on a daily basis. It's real. We may be isolated, even in their own home. We see family rejection happening to our women. How can a woman that is being rejected by her own family, who is she not cry to? They are being maltreated, and family members have rejected them and abandoned them in that situation. There is a woman that came to the center of the ministry the other day, early this year. She was beaten by her husband. And we told her, the way you are now, we need to do something about it. Is there no family member that can go to? Maybe a brother, a, 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 an aunt, anybody they can go. They said, no, they are all rejecting her. So she's left with her husband and the children. We told her you must do something about this. She said, no. After three weeks of counseling, she went back and said that she would try. When she came back in the month of March, the doctor that examined her said one eye was already gone, and she came with me. One of her legs was already broken. If this woman had someone to take her in, it would not have gotten to that stage. And at that stage, she could she could say she could no longer return to her husband. Because while I was already gone, we had to look for a temporary shelter for that woman. So family rejection. These are situations, these are consequences of gender-based violence. These women they experience this violence and there's no way for them to run to. So the family have rejected them. Now it's good for you to find yourself there, then you have put yourself there, endure it. Then we said physical consequences for gender-based violence. There can be immediate injuries which can be treated. There can also be long-time injuries, long-time physical conditions. We have some nervous issues, we have some chronic pain, like this woman. When she came in January, her eyes were okay, though she had bruises and she was attended to. When she came in the month of March, one of the eyes was already gone. And the other leg, when she was sleeping, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen to that leg. Gender based violence, happening right under our noses, it should be reduced, possibly it should be eliminated. There are psychological consequences of gender based violence. In some cases, the survivors experience psychological conditions which require medical attention. This includes post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, panic disorder, eating disorder, sexual dysfunction, no self-esteem, substance abuse. The after trauma of a girl that has been raped, you know, is not what we can explain. Some of them they come to the center, it takes hours for us to be able to penetrate. They start acting weird. They start carrying weapons even at home because of that act that they have experienced. There was a girl, a teenager that was brought by the mother. She was raped by somebody in their neighborhood. At first they tried to cover it up. But she said this way they don't have to come was because the, the, the daughter was always reaching out to knife. Any sharp object to harm the mother. Anytime she's trying to talk to her, she becomes very powerful. Those are ways people react to sexual abuse violence. They react in different ways. Some become very depressed. Some become it becomes full problem. That they are eating too much but they are no longer eating. Especially for children. There was a time three children were brought to the center, to the ministry. When they came, 
what happened when he started making investigation? The little girl that got the other two identified, she was about six years old. Except for a, for a period of time, a child that was very vibrant, very playful, she became so quiet, so timid, so she was isolating herself, so depressed, she was no longer eating. It was that eating disorder that caught the attention of a caregiver. What was going on? Try making the investigation. So she now opened up that somebody in their neighbor would defy her. So, but the girls stopped eating. They said she became emaciated. They were fine looking for what was wrong with this girl. They couldn't discover it. Until after much investigation, they discovered that an eating, uh, uh, an eating problem, an eating disorder was a result of the defilement. The man that the girl was defiling them. And when she actually opened up, the others, the others of her sisters also opened up. 10 years and 11 years old. And the man had been defined in three children, three sisters. Sexual and reproductive health consequences. Gender based violence is evil. It's an evil thing that should be stopped because of the grave consequences. It can lead to unplanned pregnancies, it can lead to unsafe abortions, it can lead to transmission of HIV and other STIs. Because during that process of violence, what can the lady do? What can the girl do? During bruises and all that, she can get infected. That's why this evil must be stopped. The same can also lead to pregnancy complications, miscarriages, low birth weight, gender-based violence in terms of defining, in terms of raping, in terms of domestic violence and more can lead to all kinds of evil consequences, miscarriages. There was even a seminar that I was in some time ago. A young lady, during one of the presentation, the, the person said, domestic violence can affect the baby in the womb. You know, most of the baby it was not possible. But there was a victim then. At the end of the, the person's presentation, a lady stood up and said that one of her ears, I think the left ear, that she cannot hear with it. Now when she was giving birth to, the mother didn't know. Why she was praying off, that way it was discovered. That it was when the mother was pregnant. The series of domestic abuse, beating, hitting in the stomach, the punches that the mother received when she was pregnant, that was affected her ear. So it was not uh, uh, the, the person that said it, was not said said it. But the victim actually stood and said she is an example that she cannot hear one of her ears. So those are consequences of gender-based violence. When we are saying gender-based violence, it's not just defining a child or rape, it's also domestic abuse. Women suffering from, from domestic violence in the acts of their of their spouses, in the acts of their husbands. Mm. This is an evil that should be stopped. Then we have other fatal consequences of gender-based violence. We say it can lead to suicide, it can lead to death, homicide, it can lead to uh, mortality from, a, from HIV to AIDS and death. When we say homicide as a consequence of gender-based violence, there was a woman that came to us sometime, not long ago, but a few months ago. She lived somewhere at uh, Otu. She sells food store provisions, snacks, drinks, and all that. In that particular street, there was an uncompleted building that was under construction. The neighbors there always come to her to buy uh, drinks, snacks, and all that. So then on this particular day, as one of the neighbors came, she, she asked, what do you want? He said, but I'll have to make you bring cold drinks and snacks to the building. So she took these cold drinks and went with him. When she got there, there was nobody outside the building. So the neighbor now said, you know what, now, that day, but it's make you come. Then I she followed him to the back. And when she got to the back, the old place was presented, just him and the man. And the man pushed her down and wanted to defy her. This is a married man with children. So she, she kept on begging. And, oh God, you know me. I think mean, they said things for her. Why do you want to do this one? Now? You know I'm a mother, I have children. Why do you want to do this? She, she was begging and pleading. This man refused. He refused. He held onto her neck, to her throat, and pushed her down. 
She said when she saw that she was going to die, she thought of her children. She now said, let her put it as if she was dead. And that was what she did. She acted as though she was dead. This man still went ahead and raped her. Went ahead and raped her. At the end of the man then, that she ran away and went to, to, to the pastor, the husband traveled, and told their pastor, it's a military person, went to go to go uh, military bars or so. And after some days, they were going to locate this man to punish him. A terrible act. The woman acted and told she was dead. And the master went ahead and defied her and raped her foul. And then the, the emotional trauma, the emotional trauma is terrible. When these women come, it takes time for us to begin to talk to them. It takes time. The women, they are so, they are so emotional because of what has happened to them. The post-traumatic stress. I wanted to use this, this word. If <laughs> they are here, when they come, they, they are like, they, yes, they can't, they, they, it takes them for to open up. That's why it is an evil. So what I'm here today, the topic, gender-based violence, how do we respond to it? It's not something that is in the news, it is happening. But our response should be to say it out there that it is happening and to campaign for its elimination. It should be stopped. Our women are suffering. And there is help for them. Most of them think that there is no help. There is help for them. If you and I can also assist. This woman, she was just there, she just didn't say anything. No, she naturally opened up. She said she had to act as if she was dead. And this man still met her hair and took her later. So we see this thing every day. And we are saying that women can make meaningful contributions to the economic development of our nation. If only they are given the chance to do so. If they are not defiled, if they are not violated. If they are not sexually abused, if they are not verbally abused. I remember, I always give this, this uh, illustration or this example. My grandmother, retired Chief Justice, she said she got married at the age of 19. In other words, she went through her school, child bread in her husband's house, and she still goes to the top in her career and profession to become the Chief Justice of the state. So that woman had the support of the husband. She had the support of the family for her to be able to do so with so many children. Our professor here, a wonderful example. If the support is not there from her husband, she will not be able to make meaningful impact in the society, in the economy, in the academic economy. She will not be able to do so. So these women, they are out there, so many of them are passionate. They want to contribute so much, but they are not given this opportunity. They are being verbally abused. They are physically abused. A woman that is beaten up with all those bruises, why do you think she can relate when, she, when she's in midst of her mates? Or when she's out there at home? How can she, how can she open up? What can she say? What do you think that woman can be able to say? With all those bruises, she will say, listen to me. I'm good for nothing. They are nothing. I'm trying to get a come that you see it, you see it in them. Yeah, they are completely frustrated that nothing can come out of them. It takes me of cancer to let them that they can, they can still be who they want to be. They can still rise up in shining stars. It takes time. There was a woman that came. I thought she was in a sea state. When she told me her hair, I thought she was just like any forties. She had four children. It was not even the physical uh, bruises that was actually a pain. It was the father violence. The things her mother was telling her. After four children, four beautiful grown up children. She got by very many. She had been with this man. This man had been beating her. So we asked her, when did this beating, beating start? He said, eh, it's begun when she had her second child. Then it's begun. The man not beat her for no reason. This particular one that made her to come to work, after beating her, she was beaten on the street. The man still picked up umbrella and was hitting her. So, before she got to the street, the last child is a boy, growing the small boy. The last child said, Mommy, I'm going to go that with wrong. 
that was what she said the point I told the wrong. I want to hold that this girl. I want you to run. You can imagine for a child to say, I want to hold that this girl and I want you to run. When I was not questioning the girl, how do you see what happened? He did put the tell about the father. You know. So we are bringing up a generation that we want to be the best. But it starts from the home. Baba, domestic violence. A child was telling the mother, Mommy, wrong. Because the other children, they are girls. So I was not wishing that I wish that the, the boy is the first child. The mother would have suffered so much. Bruce is all over, but she was looking in her sisters. Well, she was just early 40s. Then she said, We are not, we are not, uh, we are not children yet. Yeah? She said, The Baba violence. She said, The, the man used to call her smelly pussy. After putting her. That was what was paying her the most. When she said it, you could see that she was not relaxed. She was able to open her mouth. She said that. And after weeks of cancer, this woman became, you know, became herself again. You could see that life was almost going out of her. And she tried severally to get the job in the major service. Then now she's picking up her business. She's beginning to make meaningful impact. She's beginning to do something. And when one or two or three are in the society, they begin to do things. You know, we have a vibrant society, a vibrant economy. Our women want to make meaningful contribution, but violence is holding them back. Defilement is holding them back. It's affecting them and affecting our children, their children. So as a ministry, as a state, how have we responded to case of gender-based violence? I said here that the Ministry of Social Development and Gender Issues is mandated to provide professional social services to women, the elderly persons with disabilities and orphans and vulnerable children. So over the years, the ministry has provided such care and support, especially to survivors of gender-based violence. And recently, the level of care has been further advanced with the establishment of a one-stop center known as the Vivian Sexual Assault Referral Center. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. If you have heard of it, can we see our hands? Yes, the SAC Center. It's called the Vivian Sexual Assault Referral Center, situated at the Ode Nursing Home by the Golf Coast in the GRA. I want you to take this phone number down 070 46 05 Zero seven zero four six zero five five zero two six. This center was established in the month of July last year, 2020, by the state government in collaboration with Rola, who of law and anti corruption. Not only for the first day, but Rola, who we know Rola, who of law and anti in the, in the, in the European Union organization that supports. Issues like this that have to do with sexual abuse, violence, anything crime at all, they try to put their support in it. I said at this center, because our topic again, gender based violence, how we responding to it, and does it affect the economy? You will see from what we have been saying that women can make meaningful impacts, can have high productivity when they are not experiencing violence, when not, there's nothing stopping them, when there's no obstacle. But how are we responding to these cases? We can't just hear it and keep quiet. So the state has taken it up to establish a center. We all know the ministry from over, over the years have been rendering their own professional care and support. But we all know the bureaucracies, the ministries, the bottlenecks. But now we have a center, a one-stop center, where because we discovered that a woman that is being uh, violated will need medical care. A woman that is pain that is going through psychological trauma will need the help of a psychiatrist. So a woman that is going through such uh, post-traumatic stress after rape, after domestic violence, we also need counseling. So want to tell them that you can become something better. Or so want to tell the rape victim that that is not the end of life. So this center, this SAC center, I want, you, I want us to go with this today. And this center is there and it's a quick response to the cases of gender-based violence. 
and cheddar based violence is something is not something that we can just put under our table or under the carpet. It's happening out there, even very close to us. So we should take it very seriously and we should respond to it by telling people out there that there is a center that can respond to any victim, to any survivor at all. So I wrote here that at the set, at the SAC center, some following steps are taken to provide care and support. I said proper care and timely management of crimes is done there. We, and this can make difference in the lives of the survivors. I said gender-based violence survivors need special attention, especially to the children, the adolescents. The support for the victims is both clinical and psychological. When we say both clinical, for example, we have uh, a rape victim, a young adolescent, a young adult has been raped. We all know, and another thing I want us to take home today, when we hear of the case of the finance, the first thing, I know we should report at the station, the first thing that victim needs is medical care. That victim needs clinical care. Do you know why I'm saying this? Because we have realized that so many of them, after conducting tests for STIs, they are positive. So the first thing that we do is to make them see the doctor to conduct such tests and we also conduct a pregnancy test for them so that something can be done. When they are able to see a medical personnel within the first 14 hours, there is progress. Some things can be averted. So we are saying today that the other state government in collaboration with Rola has set up a center to attend to victims of GBV. And at this center, they are able to get clinical care, medical attention, before they can get psychological support, which is the counseling aspect of it. So when you hear of a case of gender-based violence, any victim at all, let them quickly report. They should go ID, let them quickly report to the center. So I also said here that detailed history and careful general physical um, methods examination is carried out them. We carry out on them so that we can get the history of how we can assist them. Many women don't report cases of gender-based violence because of the shame and all that. And at the center, confidentiality, privacy, non-judgmental attitude is portrayed. I said the center acts as an important referral point for cases in case of uh, situations where the victims they need people to want to advise them on custody issues or legal matters. That center is also there to serve as a referral point. So I said violence is widely recognized as a major entrance to social economic development, as well as the achievement of internationally agreed targets, such as the poverty reduction. Violence against women prevents women and girls from participating equally in social, economic, and political life and perpetuates the circle of poverty. One characteristic of gender-based violence is that it knows no social or economic boundaries and affects women and girls of all socioeconomic backgrounds. And this is one issue that needs to be addressed both in developing nations and developed nations of the world. Sexual violence deprives girls of education it limits their educational opportunities and, and the achievements of, for girls. As a sexual violence deprives women of financial empowerment and results in lower productivity and in turn on, they are unable to contribute meaningfully to the economic prosperity of the country. As I said, in conclusion, we must and continue to raise the awareness on the prevalence and consequences of gender-based violence and the urgent need for steps to be taken towards the reduction and possible elimination of this evil that has made life unbearable for women and girls. The lives of Nigerian women that have been lost and those that are still in German gender-based violence demand this. The violence against women and the girl child is an act of evil that must be eliminated. Little wonder the human women set a specific day aside to campaign against this scourge that has eaten so deep into the fabrics of societies all over the world. This they have done by designating November 25th 
of every year for the fight for the elimination of violence against women and girls with a 16 days activity like Plamas on that day. I said, you and I also have a role to play by joining in this campaign of elimination of violence against women and girls and also by advocating for women empowerment as well as education of the girl child. Women are not only own builders, but nation builders. Empower a woman, educate a girl child, and then you will have a progressive, productive, vibrant economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us about how prevalent gender-based violence actually is. Because some of us, there were many opposition for how prevalent it is. Thank you so much. I thank you for what you are doing to rehabilitate victims and... Do we have questions? Wow. Okay. How many questions are we taking? Let's wait our hands together and we know... Questions and contributions. Okay, we'll take our contributions first. So we said that the chairman of the board speak to us. Thank you for the presentation. And we have the opportunity to thank the two presenters who did a wonderful work. In fact, a uh, prof presentation was like the foundation for her own. And we thought that was planned it very well for us. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that most of the persons who come to your center report are female. Are you sure men? are not also suffering the same thing and because of cultural uh, shame or what has right to be, they are afraid to come forward or they are shy to come forward to say that they are being harassed by their, their wives. And what happens means that when you say the when the man violates uh, the woman verbally, she will be depressed and then she will come to your center. Can she not reply? How many you smell I will call you a smelly dog. So there's no something. Okay, they will now be passed. Because when I'm saying this, I, when I was teaching in the secondary school in this town, a lady was suffering the same thing. So what elderly woman amongst us that we teach her, now told her that. She was always telling us that the other one was always teaching her. And two of us were young women. I was also a young woman then. I didn't have any solution for her because I wasn't experiencing it. So one advanced woman now told her that women, one day, just someone for his power. And look for something, but don't, they don't give him hope. Don't be idle. Look for something like belts or cane, high cane, and fix him very well. But this man will never try it again. Can I give you a thought to that man? Okay. She has a very good example for that one. I mentioned part of it when I said the woman was born. There was a woman that came to the ministry recently. She complained of inflated by hot water. She showed, she showed her hand to us, her hand was bumped to see it. So when we were taking down our inquiry to call the man to come, because normally of course they are, they are procedures, but we can't hear such things and not respond. So when we were taking calls to the man, it was report and all that. Before we knew it, the man came. When the man was coming, I was going to your to your fear, when the man was coming, he was not wearing a shirt. Why was he not wearing a shirt? But his own boss was worse. What happened? The man is used to beating all this woman. On this fateful day, she was burning water on the gas. The man was beating her. Then she now responded. When you said she, you know, she can respond, she responded. And that anger, the man carried the hot uh, kettle to splash on her. So she noticed it and used her hand to hit the, 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 to flip the kettle. 
So what you are thinking is what we have on our hand. Now that she suffer bonds on our own hand, then the man's bag was totally bonds. Because she flings it to twelve on the man. So we ask the man to go for medical care first before we go attend to both of them. But that, that's the response. You know, but it, it, what we are saying here today is that most women don't cry out. They are suffering this thing, they don't cry out. They need to cry out. Because in the ministry or in our the center, we don't just say, oh, leave your husband, leave your husband, divorce your husband. No. But by the time there is a threat to life, our women should not expect for them. What are those days when they died in that situation? There is help for they can cry out. They can separate for a while until the situation becomes better and they return back to their homes. There, is a, there are two scenarios I want to play before us today. Real. This, this uh, man, what put into the ministry was first on the issue. The man said he wanted the children. The grandmother of their late mother said, of the, of the children said no. So, so while they were always coming to the ministry, the man was dragging the children and the, 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 the late wife's mother said no. Because we all know that in case of such a thing, such death of, the father should have custody of the children when the woman is not there. But in this situation, the mother of the late woman said no. So on this particular day in the office, when they came, one of the young children said, and eh, that if you are not pushed mommy, mommy will not have died. God made that little child to squash it out. But the man thought that they were very little, they would not be able to say what happened. So the man was used to beating the wife. The wife was pregnant. The man was used to used to beating up this woman. The man never voiced it out. But this faithful day, when he beat her and pushed her, think that he would take her to the hospital normally. The man got to the hospital and never came back home. And if the kids were able to say, they never fought through it. Don't be able to say anything. But this boy said, if you are not pushed money like that, she will not have died. Now when we began to investigate and discover the man was actually abusing, domestically violating the wife to the point of death. So what are we saying here today? Our mention of is not for you to die in that situation. When it becomes so terrible, you can separate for a while until things become better. There's another situation of the woman that separated from the husband. When the man saw that the wife went to the squadrons with their little baby, the other three were not in. She was thinking the man was able to handle property. The woman took the sucking baby and went to the squad and was there. The man was going to visit them to give them money for food. The woman refused, I don't want anything from you. This one is with me because he's still sucking. When he's through the sucking, I will bring him over to you. I don't want your money, I don't want anything from you again. The man left, separated from the man. When the man saw, that it was not the wealth that kept that woman in his house all these years, despite the abuse. The woman, after, after some months, the man, after rethinking, he came back from this man was begging to make their settled. If that woman had not separated for a while, only God knows what would have happened. She ran for her life and things became restored. If that woman had died, she, if she had sought for help, she would not have been pregnant. The man thought after taking her to the hospital, the man did not see her. She would come back. And then that day, the man did come back. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was the professor for a very good lecture. And uh, I have to hear. I already decided that I was not going to say something. But I was afraid, can I leave here as a professor not say something? That means I didn't profess anything. <laughs> that would be valid by professor. Then if I was saying something, I looked at the team, women and development. I would say I ought not to also say something. This is about women, women and women. And I whispered to my friend here. Then you should also organize it all. Let's also talk about violence against men. And, and somebody mentioned it. You mentioned it, I said, yeah, you were speaking, you were speaking my mind. And then you talk from a cultural perspective. You must situate any academic business in a hospital. So they are talking about violence and violence. In what political culture are you situating it? 
Is it the Western perspective or the African perspective? What is that? Yeah. Yeah. If you are not able to situate me there, that's an intellectual cash landing. That's my position. Now, are we not really weak? When did you show someone who say we need our weak assets? How about just laughing? They are strong assets. <laughs> we are we're not from the capital that we're pretending from part of Nigeria. My part are from women. Are we not aware? Yes. Who are we thinking that we are rich? My wife is on rich, she controls me. Men are rich. She loves your head, she controls you with direct position on the money. So are you what are you mean? I don't I do not think that women are weak. Again, uh my auntie said something and uh, I'm a very pragmatic professor, very down to edge. I'll send him in the best of these things at some time. Somebody said, no matter the dress a woman does, you should not yes, I agree. I'm against women balance. But that does not preclude you from telling them not to dress the way they do. So I'm very provocative. And I'm, I do know that there's double dress code in the University of Benin now. Why is it really for dress code? So come from all these things. So I'm going to tell our younger ones the way they dress and all of that. Maybe we should be able to talk about the forms of violence. Which some of us are related to here. Yeah, should be for the person to exhaust it. We might need to talk about many forms of violence that even the men domestically and entirely suffer from women. Well, the men, let's have a conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Good afternoon, everybody. I am proud of what I had from my colleague on the table. I had the best, the best, the best chains and shopping and all that. What did it cost me? What did it cost me? What cost me to be violent? What is costing them? That is something that we need to look at. My learned professor just mentioned something political, consciousness, culture, culture is the highest form of religion. I had somebody pray here this morning. We forgot our ancestors. Thank you, sir. We forgot our ancestors. When you forget your culture, you must jog yourself in the pit. All that you narrated are only dead. It's something that is bigger. It's underlying the costs you are, the effect you are narrating. My ear was poisoned. I didn't want to hear them because they're not good for the mind. Nigerians have left themselves in religion, religion, Christianity, and Islam have made us to forget ourselves. We no longer know who we are. We listen outside. My paper is stuck because all I have for Nigeria is in the book African Women and Political Development. My learned friend mentioned something. Womanhood, the mother of the universe, is an African. So woman is stronger hundred times than man. God gave the energy to the womanhood because she is the mother, and that ability is what allows her to be able to care for both the children and the husband and the house. But we've been carried away by great colonial conditions that 
man is the head of the home. Yes, he go ahead. Like he said, <laughs> women are the best advisor to some of our so-called, <laughs> what we call them, uh, uh, rulers. They are no leaders. We don't have leaders in Nigeria. Otherwise, all that has been happening would have stopped if leadership was laid in hands of those who founded this republic. Those who are there now are strangers to this country and they, they are willing to destroy us. And we abandon ourselves to this foreign religion to the point that we don't even know where we are going or where we're coming from. History has been removed from, from the school curriculum of our children. If you don't know yesterday, you cannot know today, and you don't know where you are going. My people, let us go back to our culture. This violence will end. Nobody appreciates. I will not allow my daughter to go with a man who is not conscious, who does not respect women. But some of us, I don't know if I say that, oh, have your vision, believe in yourself. You have to be given an orientation that allows you to know who you are before you can believe yourself. And this is what culture provides. The Nigerian culture is the best in the universe. That's what my position has been. I've been in America for a long time, but I have never forgotten my home. The first human to have two women in America, made by a Nigerian and American. My American girl, 17, brought my Nigerian wife to children to the United States because that's my culture. If you leave yourself for others, what do you want them to do? No. Please, don't begin to hammer on the event. Let's challenge the root of our issue, of the issues at stake. This violence and your palliative effect that we can throw away once you know who you are and believe in yourself. Let's pray through our ancestors to the God of the universe. And we, all of that, it is not a white man's knowledge to know that the divine is us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zandi, I'm a part of the law. Uh, uh, Prof was talking about men putting up a, a conference, talking about tradition of the men. And uh, you talked about tradition too. Traditionally, men are expected to be strong. Men are expected to be protectors of women. So with which mouth would you come out, even when you are violated as a man, to come and say you've been violated? It's shameful. Nobody will even believe you. So uh, the reason that men are not reported is not like men are not violated. They can't come out for the shame because they are ordinary ought to be protected. So it will be difficult. Uh, I want to make contributions uh, towards the way forward. Uh, the reasons why uh, gender-based violence uh, up until now have, have not been linked to the board. Uh, one of it uh, basically is because of the family relationships. Uh, just last week, we saw on ITV uh, a man who abused his stepchild with hot knives. I don't know how many of you saw it. You know, when that happened, neighbors reacted, uh, police got involved. But there was something the wife said. After they had taken the husband away, he said, No, they should bring him back home. I cannot take care of this student alone. <laughs> it's a major challenge. Even when there is rape and defilement within the family circle, you see because of the bond, because of the relationship that exists between the girl who is a victim and probably the father who is the perpetrator, it's difficult sometimes to report. This is less difficult within the family. Even when it goes out, you see the woman also running to the police to beg for leniency and for release. So it's a major challenge. And we need to start talking to the family unit uh, on the need to allow such persons to be disciplined, to serve as deterrents, 
to others to learn. Secondly, uh, if this issue must be taken care of, I think our police uh, needs proper orientation. More often than not, we find out that the willpower to investigate uh, some of these issues are not with the police at all. Sometimes the issue of bribery and corruption have also uh, hindered proper investigation of gender-based violence. Sometimes the police is, the officer is aware that it happens. He may take money. He may take money to call out things. So, and again, uh, the investigation systems are still yet very shitty. Today we talk about forensic investigations. Most of our police officers are not trained to go deep into investigation. A uh, few months ago during the COVID, I wrote an article uh, on the need for stricter punishments for rape. My interest was rape. I've come to discover that there are laws that speak against uh, sexual violence, the criminal code, penal code, child rights act, and so many of them. But I have looked at it to see that the punishment is not strict enough, especially for the defilement of a child less than 18 years. I'm advocating personally either death punishment or castration of such an individual. Because until we begin to take stringent measures, these things will not stop. My little contribution. Thank you very much, sir. So the very first person that raised my hand will take her question and will come to you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I have uh, two questions and one contribution. In short, let me say I have, because he has uh, crowned some things for me, lawyer, from the Lord. <laughs> yes, he has crowned some things for me. I, I'm particularly interested in solutions. Uh, Professor John, my dear son, no son. Uh, I, I understand very much where you're coming from. And I was going to ask you, what is the solution to not speaking the language to the children? I am a Benin woman married to Anessa Command, your son. <laughs> so, I have tried teaching my children the language, Benin language, which is the mother tongue, because I'm the one that they are closer to in the sense that I'm the mother. The stay at home one. Yes. Or the supposed stay at home mother. So I can't teach them the language. I'm a lecturer, but I can't teach my children the language. How do we go forward from there? Okay. Sorry, sir. Maybe I should just ask all the questions. Yeah. Thank you very much for that uh, comment. This is my application over the years. Men, young one, young Nigerian. I'm not a child, I don't think there's anyone here. I don't know. I'm not sure. In my court, if you meet a girl, and that girl, you like her. The first thing you do is to give her a name. Speak through the name to that girl. The name you give will speak your heart to the girl. Then if she agrees, the next thing is to introduce her to your culture. My American wife, whom I told you I met, 17 years old, when same class now speaks and writes my language, it's actually So if the man teaches the girl right from the word go, and the girl accepts, she will be the one to transfer that language to children that are coming up. This is why women are feel that when you marry a young man, it is your responsibility to assist that young man to build and you know, elongate that family to continue. But what is happening now is that, oh, the guy wants to uh, be from Robo, and the guy is from Ibo, the best thing to adopt English language. That is a serious omission. It is actually a crime against our nation. 
to my advice you for marrying and a profession, very disciplined people, learn the language, get some of these cities, Wazili, uh, another, Shuma, Baobet, play them. Since you can learn French through asset listening to, there is no reason you cannot learn it at all by buying the city and learn the language. Please, we don't want that language to die. I'm promoting it. I think it's in US. Only my institute for traditional development will be uh, ATAS, uh, Duke, Yoruba, and all that. So white men, white people. Both white and black. I am an African. I have many black Americans in the class. Hence, the book, African names are the reason for a name. I want all the African Americans to reclaim their Africanness through identifying themselves with an African name. And the same thing I appeal to Nigeria. The idea that I am a Christian, I am a Muslim, therefore that is why I am Jacobo, is nothing. You can become a, an Islamic person without there to becoming an Arab. Yes. You can become a Christian without being a Jew or a British man. So let us not get carried away because of these people who think that they are playing dirty politics or tribalism and racism with us. And we are certain we should not thank you. Thank you so very much, sir. I'm grateful. So no um, I had a, a, a case of somebody working for me in staff. I discovered that she was sneaking into the establishment to do something. So I tried questioning her. She came with all her children. I discovered that her husband had done something to her. So I tried to find out. And so she opened up and told me that, uh, okay, let her just tell me what happened. That she intended to come and sleep. In the office, yes, in her family, I said that's not possible. Yeah. What, what happened? I told, and then she told me that her husband was having sexual activity with her first child. She came from another marriage with that child, so he was a biological father. I first cried, I cried to my heart delight. And then I, I told her that she should go to her mother's house. She cannot sleep in the establishment. She should go to her mother's house with her children and then go to the Ministry of Women Affairs immediately in the morning, make the report and let them take, take care of that issue. She came back the following week and told me they had this wrong case. I was so angry with her and I told her that whatever she sees the news, she should take it. Today, her, the biological children she had, she never had four other children for that man. The biological girls she had for that man were also sexually abused by the man. And she came crying. When she saw me, she just burst out crying. Although I heard the story, I was angry. So when she came, she started crying. I told her, I want you. Why don't you do something now? She said, yes, she has gone to the ministry. They have collected her children from her. Now she's from from time to fire. You know, it's worse. So I don't know, the solution I'm asking for, like you said, sir, that the police needs to be, so I don't know, they need orientation. She told me that her husband was arrested, the case was in court, and well, the husband has money, he has tried his way out of the station. So he's no longer in prison, her children are caged in, uh, I don't know, one orphanage that they have been taken to, and they have babies, they are not well taken care of and all that. So the solution, like you said, sir, please, those men need to be castrated. <laughs> One of them is to yell at a veteran to others. I want to stop it. That's what I want to do. My contribution. My contribution. I'm sorry, I'm just rushing up a bit because I, I don't want to take too much time. Ma, thank you so much for inviting me. I conceived yesterday that I was going to contribute a painting and the head of section of painting at the Trauma Campus uh, section. So I conceived that painting and I think it will fit that wall. So I'm going to frame it and send it to you. I don't know, the car was too small, so that's why I couldn't do it now. 
a mother should be vigilant. I've had a case of asked to handle. The girl has graduated now as a medical doctor, but she is still bitter against her mother. Someone was abusing her in the home, and the mother refused to notice the cues. She runs after the mother, and the mother is driving up crying. The mother will say, go back, and she goes back to the abuser. So, mothers, watch out. Care for your children to the extent of looking at their eyes and knowing what is going on when you are not there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's go have a really young person to speak, please. <laughs> to the organizers of this event, distinguished academics, and particularly my professor and teacher from the Department of Political Science, thank you for the invitation. Now, I will not say that the issue of um, gender-based violence has been overflowed because there is need for us to actually continue to lay emphasis on it based on the rampant, the rampant nature of you know, what it is currently in the society. But I think that we should look at the aspect of causation. There is a causal effect to this. So this has to be looked at. And you, you find out that immodest dressing happens to be a factor. You know, I'm not saying that in all of the cases, but in some cases, immodest dressing is a factor. Mm -hmm. Then we look at mental disorder. Now, during my days at Delta State University, uh, there was this case that actually happened um, whereby a madman had raped a lady and even all the efforts to, you know, to try to you know, separate him from the lady was aborted. He finished everything. I mean, it was so devastating. Now, we have to look at mental disorder and we also have to look at uh, the issue of oriental you know, deficiency. Oriental deficiency, some places are not where oriented when you talk about the issue of violence in all perspectives. So this has to be looked at. Then the issue of boy child or the male child education. I think the gender based um, institutes should also look at this. And Madam Barrister, I think your ministry should also look at this. When we talk about female um, based violence, we should also look at male based violence. We should also look at how to orient the male child. Let them know that this is bad, they should not venture into this, there's a need to take precaution and all of that. Then lastly, how do we enlighten you know, the youths or those who actually are into this? How do we enlighten them? You can see when you talked about um, the agency that actually handled this issue, many of us do not even know about the agency. And we, we here are quite enlightened to a reasonable extent. So if we don't know these agencies, how can we help to curb or possibly eradicate the, uh, the issue on the ground? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me go to Iraq. Let me go to Iraq. I will have a hands in strength to the men. Well, good morning, uh, Professor and good afternoon. I just want to ask what the topic for today is. I think the focus for today is about women. And I, I am so disappointed that we are in a way deviating from it. If there's an avenue to speak about men, I'm sure the topic will be about men and violence. But the truth is we are looking at a topic where women are involved. And we see issues of culture and so many things, and we are keeping a blind eye. I remember somebody made the question that somebody came to her office and seemed mad to be sincere. The things that are abused are not left alone to handle issues on their own. I believe what we ought to have done was not victim. We are looking for a way forward. When somebody comes to your office and says, carry the woman to the welfare center yourself for the person to seek help, that is the way forward. And the truth is, even when you find the most of them, you go back to this abusive relationship. And that doesn't mean we should give up. We should just keep pushing. Because the moment you give up, something else will happen. That's just the truth. And please, I must say, indecent dressing is not a justice for violence. I will keep saying this. If not, so we should also look at men that are indecently dressed. So it's not, a, it's not an opportunity. The woman has a right to her dignity. She can set her wet pants if she wants to. It's her life. No man should not take advantage of it to rape her. It's her life. Don't take a problem of a child as men. You open your, you open your belly and you tie just that on your chest. I remember the mom saying they used to wear wet pants there, the women. So they were not raped. So why is it this time around? So this should be an opportunity to say, because you know what you said to the There's something we keep doing, and I want to point it out. 
victim blaming is wrong. You don't blame a victim that suffers psychologically, emotionally, and all what you see blame her, even as parents, what you want to do When you see a friend, is not an or is not an outstate. It's not an invitation to be raped. Going to visit a male friend in his own self is not an opportunity to be raised. We should call the bull by the hand and do what is needed. And I don't believe that stiffer offenses or stiffer punishments is what we have raised. We all have a responsibility collectively. We all have, as professors, as doctors, as market women, we all have a responsibility. When we keep saying a society where a woman uh, she's empowered, yes, a woman has the power to carry the responsibility of the house. But when it comes to strength, the woman doesn't have it. And when you talk about violence, a man always wields what? He's the head of the home. I heard somebody say, when a woman abuses a woman, a man, a man insults him back. No. Some women may not want to insult back. But that shouldn't be a reason why the man should keep doing what he's doing. We should be our brother's keeper. This is happening around us. What is the way forward? Is that we also should take the party by helping these victims and never giving up and never pointing a finger back at them that I see. Never pointing a finger. So let's stick to the topic and let's see what is the way forward. Men can help, women can help, children can help, and at the end, of society will also find the solution. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so there's one thing that has um, recorded in most of the discussions we have been saying, and it's that of empowerment. People have said, oh, these women go back to the man. I mean, um, my colleague Gandhi said that, and our professor said that. The question is, why are they going back to the man? It's because they lack empowerment. No woman would want to stay in an abusive relationship if she can fend for herself. The reality on the ground is that many women in this situation not get me wrong, we find educated women, doctors, lawyers who have been as abused. There's a case I'm handling. She's a doctor who, is being, who was beaten by her husband for being on call at night. The doctor had to be on call. When he was dating her, he used to come and see her. Now, she's, uh, she's now, uh, what they call it now, she's cheating on him when she's on call at night. But the most majority of the women in this situation lack empowerment and so that is why they go back. So question to you Madam Musco, what does your ministry do in situations where a woman does not, I mean she doesn't have the way we do to take care of herself? You were saying that we encourage them to go back to their families and uh, friends and so on and so forth. What if they don't have those, you talk about families rejecting them. So in a situation where a woman does not have a family to run to or friends to go what does the ministry do in such situations? And I think there's nothing to do then to think about what can be done in such situations. Thank you. Thank you. One more. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mijin Amari from History and National Service. My question is to the barrister. Is it that the ministry is constrained to act in certain cases? Because you made mention of a case that woman and I was uh, blinded. Since she came, initially, then later when I came back, it's a blind guy. So I was thinking, is, is it that there was no solution or they could not do anything to the man? I don't know. Is it that there's a yeah, constraint or challenge? Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my question is, Madam. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was with my mom, and she was having a conversation with another lady, and it was about um, the marriage issue. So, um, my they were talking, and the other lady was like, I think they were arguing about the issue, and she was like, the woman was supposed to know her place in the home. Like, she uh, statement made her feel inferior. So, my question is, if Women are to be um, liberated. Um, so what, what should be instilled from them? Is it that kind of knowledge? Have your ministry held on um, the general women um, conference to instill the right knowledge on them? Thank you. I think that's all the questions we'll take. Madam, please respond. Okay, I will just respond with you in two minutes. 
for the case of the man that went back to the came back to the blind eye, when she came at once, if you have followed the lecture, when she came reporting domestic power, she was encouraged to separate from his past for a while, since the police on her body would just do it. But she was like that, she said she was like, let's go please to go back, she has to go back to her husband. So not that the center was not uh, was constrained to stopping her problem or helping her. She was actually encouraged not to return to such terrible abusive uh, spouse for some time. But she went back. She went back. And when she came back, like she said, like she went over there from a uh, tripod to fire became worse for her. And that separation was she was now forced to separate from the man to, you know, for a while. The, the, one of the challenges that we have had is that the state still do not have uh, a permanent shelter for victims of GBV. We are hoping that very in the shortest possible time we want to have one. So when we find such people who are helpless, they can go there for temporary shelter. And like I was wondering now, I said we empower a woman, that women, they are not just world builders, they are also nation builders. When you empower them, they are no longer helpless. Most of our women, the reason why they don't report GBV is because they, want to, they don't have help anywhere. They want to remain there because they don't have any other source of income. Then when you empower such a woman by providing skills for her, the ministry, in collaboration with the state, we have skill centers and it's free for women. We have one at the uh, that towards uh, the Adua area. We have one at, uh, um, I think I don't know for so. We have some around. So when you call, the skills that you learn at the street, get trip, salary, you can start with this something little. Just means that they not empower the skill. Our women go back to such abusive homes because they, they, they still don't have anything to sustain themselves. So women should be empowered and the girl child should be given moral uh, uh, training. You know, let's empower let's empower our let's empower our girl child. And, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Without your presence, there wouldn't have been a seminar. So I really appreciate you. And that you stay to the very end. I can see Barista Mrs. Esther Oriaro, the Director of Center for Gender Studies, Akuse um, Polo. You are welcome. To our speaker and to all the professors here and everyone that has stayed, we are very busy people. So that you have stayed to the end shows that you have high regard for us. I want to thank the IC, uh, I, uh, CROP, ICT unit. They are, they are live streaming this event and doing, uh, you can still watch it after now. And I believe a lot of people will benefit from this uh, discourse we are about today. Professor uh, uh, Ojo has talked from the uh, perspective of women, tradition, and development. Let's give him another. So, uh, because of the inaugural lecture, we're going to just say closing prayer, and then we take a group photograph. Thank you very much. Shall we stand up for closing prayer? In Jesus' name, our dear Father, we thank you so much for the success of this seminar. We thank you, O Lord, for the impact. And we know it's going to have a ripple effect. Because all everyone sitting here and those who will listen, we extend these solutions to others. So that, Lord, we will be aware of our, the great contribution that the woman, the African woman, has for development. And that also, if the challenge of gender-based violence is removed or ameliorated, the woman will contribute more. Father, we pray that this seminar will be more impactful even as time goes on. Because more people will hear about the evils of gender-based violence and they will take decisions and help other people. And those who are in need, oh Lord, will have the boldness to step out of this in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the university, our vice chancellor and the management team. Thank you for the board the chairman of the board and members of the board and every staff and everyone that have contributed towards the success of this 
program. We recognize and acknowledge Mr. Egambo, who is who is the chairman of the organizing committee and every member who has contributed. Father, bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Heavenly Father. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Oh.